One of the quickest realizations a new MVM player makes is that the meta loadouts diverge heavily from what's typical in the base game. Some of the best weapons become some of the worst, some of the worst weapons become some of the best, and some of the more forgettable options gain a newfound celebrity status. If you've watched this channel before, there's a good chance you're familiar with my MVM tier list series. Nearly two years later, and I still think a majority of the entries hold up fine. But when you're directly comparing over over 130 different weapons, you're bound to make a few miscalculations every now and again. As much as I try to dissuade people from taking my word as gospel, not everyone decides to heed that call. I say jump, you all ask how high. Literally. A bit of a change in the criteria this time around though. The solo queue perspective and weapon slot only comparisons are still intact. But now, we're not restricting the map and mission pool to strictly two cities. Every Valve mission is on the table. This limitation was originally made as a product of my inexperience with other tours, but we've gotten a lot more perspective ever since that time period. For the majority of the weapon pool, it doesn't shift their viability all that much, but it's definitely notable for a couple of them, and we're gonna address all of that today. This will probably be the last time we rank items in MVM, and I don't expect this updated ranking to ever get invalidated. So, let's do it properly this time. Fuck, I'm out of tickets. Alright, give me a sec. Gentlemen, my deal with Apex Gaming PCs is still online. If you're a pre-built pleb like yours truly, here's the place to be. You can swap parts to your heart's content and choose between financing payments monthly or all in one check. To be fully transparent, yes, building your own PC from scratch will usually cost less money. But personally, I'd rather get sodomized with the Vita saw than chip through that process myself. So, it's the same as before. If you're looking for a snazzy pre-built, click the link in the description below and use code TF2 for up to $250 off your first purchase. Alright, back to the weapons. First up for Scout, I think the Criticola wasn't given a fair trial. The main gripe I always had with this item was that the mini crit effects acted as a redundancy with both the Fan of War and a Soldier's Buff banner. This can be true, but it ignores many of the situational hangups intrinsic to solo queue play. What if the Giant isn't in range of the Fan? What if the Giant is at a low enough HP threshold to where running in for a swing isn't worth it? What if the Soldier doesn't have his buff banner charged? Who's to say he's even running it in the first place because beggars conch shits on everything harder than Amber Heard in a mattress factory. The buffs overlapping are much more uncommon than expected, so the mini crit damage is quite the benefit the vast majority of the time. Not to mention being able to one-shot uber medics as long as you have a single point of damage and the cheap-ass ammo canteens to keep that cooler packed. You start chugging, you hit like a train. For random lobbies, I'd say the milk is definitely preferred, but I think the cola's offensive capability easily bump it up. Strong B tier. Next up, the Candy Cane. While I did make the point that it was probably the best melee in the D tier, it doesn't deserve the same shelf space as the Boston Basher or Stock Bat. Now, I still agree that the Candy Cane's health pack on kill mechanic is in no way worth the added 25% explosive vulnerability whenever that downside is relevant. Thing is, it's not always relevant. Some waves have minimal or even no blast damage robots on the field, which means in those situations, the Candy Cane has zero built-in downsides whatsoever. This means that for a more aggro scout playstyle, you can litter the field with tiny health packs for your teammates. Which sounds like a massive plus, but... And not really. Even ignoring Medic entirely, both Health on Kill and the Engineer's Dispenser will be much more of use than the tiny health packs that mandate a 100 yard dash. For that reason, it doesn't compete with the Mark for Death melees, but I'd say it's on par with the Atomizer. C tier. And finally, we have the Babyface's Blaster, the first demotion of the video. My patience has run dry attempting to make this gun work. It's still very much the case that you'll retain your boost after most encounters a surprisingly high amount of the time, but the value of the boost mechanic as a whole doesn't really have much of a place in MBM. Sure, you can run around the map on foot and retrieve money at a faster rate, or you could just, you know, lie to it. Sure, you can dodge oncoming fire more easily while staying grounded, but you know what's even easier? 
jumping. Sure, you can save money by not needing to buy movement speed early on, but unless you want a damage hit, we all know where those extra credits are going. That's not even mentioning all the other downsides, like the inability to bullet surf without a speed reduction, the crippled rollouts if you do happen to die, and the biggest kicker of basically forfeiting your ability to redirect aggro away from your team. Since you either have to tank the damage, which loses your boost, or jump away to avoid the damage, which loses your boost. There's no contest with this one. It's the bottom of the barrel. I also had a couple of people mention that I underrated the force of nature, and I do not agree. The mid-air knockback forces you to play nearly as grounded as the BFB does, and the launch effect it gives to robots neuters both the scout's DPS and the DPS of his teammates. The added mobility and occasional cheese potential are nowhere near enough to make up for that downside. If anything, I underrated the backscatter, as, like the Criticola, this scatter gun can one-tap ubermedics with only a single point of the damage upgrade. There's also a case to be made that the stock scatter gun doesn't belong in the same tier as the shortstop, but okay. Here's every scatter gun ordered from worst to best. No more ambiguity. Now on to Soldier, and for this one, I've elected to make the semi-controversial decision of moving the airstrike from the B tier up to the A tier. The original ranking was a notable point of contention, some going as far to say that this rocket launcher is the best in the game, even outclassing the beggar's bazooka. It doesn't, like it's not even close, but I do agree I didn't give the airstrike enough credit. I found it difficult to separate this launcher from its use alongside the base jumper, mostly because whenever I saw other people using it, that was the go-to secondary 95% of the time. But if the decade-long beggar's pilling process has taught us anything, it's that the optimal soldier loadouts aren't always proportional to their in-game popularity. The airstrike is one such case, where it arguably pairs even better with the conch or buff banner for a good majority of the waves. Staying airborne enough to rapid fire the whole clip is usually pretty feasible, and if not, the jump height upgrade stacks with the effects of rocket jumping, and just one tick will be all you need to alleviate that worry. The damage penalty, lower splash radius, constantly swallowing a rocket just to go airborne, and the more frequent amounts of fall damage are all definitely gripes but for the added benefit of having the fastest rocket firing speed in the game, all while still being able to retain a banner, I think that's usually worth it. The airstrike isn't the best, and hell, the stock rocket launcher's consistency might still have it beat for the runner-up spot. But if it's your favorite from a gameplay perspective, ditch the parachute every once in a while. I've also changed my opinions on soldier's melee weapons. Specifically, the Equalizer, the Escape Plan, and the Disciplinary Action. Starting with the worst of the bunch, I'm bumping the Equalizer up to the B tier. You might think that's because of this thing's absurd tank-busting properties, as many a comment have pointed out. But to be honest, this is quite the non-factor. Sacking half of your damage output in exchange for melting down a tank like 15% faster isn't a good trade-off. Not to mention its lack of synergy with the conch. The real moneymaker actually comes from the red. The more time it takes for your wounds to heal, the more ubercharged thy medic will peel. Shooting yourself in the face and letting the medic farm off of you is your best use of downtime should your banner be offline. And it being the safest and most reliable weapon to use while doing so, that deserves props. Which brings us to the escape plan and the disciplinary action, which nowadays I would swap in the rankings. You ever learn something so late into the game's lifespan that you feel like a fucking moron for not recognizing it earlier? I mean, I just figured out a month ago that Pierre had a secret dance club in the blue spawn. 11,000 hours, by the way. Well, for some reason, it completely flew over my head at the time that the escape plan had the exact same uber generation properties as the equalizer. 11,000 hours, by the way. I remember I would literally switch off the escape plan and onto the equalizer just so I could help my medic farm more efficiently. I think I had like 200 tours at this point. If we compare the pick's retreating abilities to the general all-purpose utility of the whip, I do think the latter has the edge. But upon factoring in the escape plan's better uber generation, it's clearly top of the pack. The whip's boost on hit effect I still do find underrated, giving your heavy more damage ramp up, giving your rocket jumps more momentum, and helping you and your tank busting buddy get back to the front lines are all excellent qualities. But me likes shiny rockets, and pickaxe makes shiny rockets happen more. While we're on the topic of melees with weird healing alterations, the backscratcher deserves a bit of an uplift. 
It's actually quite similar to the candy cane, in that it's one of the only melees in the game that transcends the only while active qualifier that the vast majority of them come packaged with. You can't effectively toggle this weapon's positive or negative attributes. You're stuck with them the whole time. For this reason, I can't sing the same uber farming praises that I can with the pickaxes. While your lower healing from medi beams does help your medic farm more easily, that comes with a massive recurring cost to your own survivability. More uber doesn't mean shit if you're constantly dead. However, what if you don't have a medic on your team? Or you do, but you're on different segments of the map. Well, in those situations, the backscratcher is pretty good. For example, on Bot Bash, it's not uncommon to see teammates forego a heavy medic combo in favor of stacking AoE classes. For a pyro in this situation, if you do nothing but camp the medium health kit up front, it undoubtedly provides you with more survivability than any other melee. This likewise goes for the Manhattan missions. Usually the pyro goes up top to deal with the Fist of Steel heavies, while the medic stays down below with everyone else. So that health pack up top is all yours, and the backscratcher makes the most of it. To be clear, the vast majority of the time, running this weapon isn't worth it. Even on teams that don't have a medic. On many of the older maps, the medkits are farther away from the front lines, and your next best healing outlet is an engineer's dispenser, which also receives the nerfed healing property. So, not great, but there are specific situations where its benefits do shine through. Moving on to demo, in hindsight, I don't think I should have roped in the booties with all of the shields. In the original tier list, I looked at two perspectives for each ranking. The role it fills in relation to an optimal demo man, and in relation to an optimal demo knight. However, there was one playstyle I neglected to mention. The less trap-heavy, more AoE-focused playstyle of the standard sticky launcher. If I'm going to account for demo knight, there's no reason not to account for this demo variation as well. And in that respect, the booty serve a valuable purpose. You don't need the pills if your stickies do the job better in every situation. And for the stock sticky launcher in particular, at least when your reload and firing speeds are maxed out, it pretty much always does. You're giving up emergency firepower for added durability, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad call. Definitely not worth it for the more viable Scottish Resistance meta, but it's pretty good for the two alternative playstyles, so I think a light B tier makes more sense. On the topic of melees, I think the stock bottle merits a bit more praise. In the current day, I actually think it lands in A tier. It isn't that the stock melee is a good weapon, it's more so an indictment on how many shit students are in this class. The bottle doesn't harm you in any way, which is more than you can say about, well, pretty much every single one of Demo's other melees. Make no mistake, even for a standard demo, I still believe the Islander is ahead of the curve in terms of MVM viability. Its only real drawback is that it takes more effort to use, needing to keep track of not only your sticky traps, but also looking out for whatever straggling prey you can get your hands on. But if it wasn't made abundantly clear, I'm lazy. So even though the Islander is still technically better, the bottles become my comfort pick and I have no regrets. Also, the original video was released before the Iron Bomber's hitbox got nerfed. I got a couple of questions asking as to whether or not this changes the weapon's placement, and I don't believe it does. You'll often get more residual damage from the rollers than you would from stock's increased explosion range. And more consistent bomb jumps are always a plus. Though frankly, the gap is so close at this point that you can basically call them both S tier without issue. Fuck it, may as well. On to the heavy, and seeing as the new criteria widens up the mission pool, I think you all know where we're going. The Natasha is a fantastic counterpick minigun and deserves a strong C tier. Being able to lock down any super scout, the most common threat for low tour groups, is immensely powerful, especially if no one else on the team is knowledgeable enough to pin them down. The 25% damage penalty prevents it from being any higher, but on a couple of waves, it's a shocking good deal. Probably the items I've moved the most on are, surprisingly enough, the lunchbox items. I've elected to shift around three quarters of them. Unlike in PvP game modes where the effects upon consumption
consumption to find the item's viability. In MBM, their primary use case is the medkit activated once dropped. Generally speaking, it's a scarce last resort heal, and consequently, this means that these slower, yet more impactful medium health pack drops move the needle much more than the minor ones with an increased recharge rate. So with that out of the way, let's go down the list. At the top of the food chain in S tier, the sandwich lies uncontested. It has a medium medkit drop and maintains the ever-present ability to heal back to full when in a pinch. It's pretty rare to be in a situation where you're at low HP and can safely chow down, but when those moments do occur, you'll be happy to have it. One rung below, we have the Buffalo Steak Sandwich. If anyone tells you that this item is unviable in Man vs. Machine, they're fucking lying. Like the sandwich, it also drops a medium medkit, though unlike the sandwich, it trades an on-demand self-heal for an occasional increase in tank DPS courtesy of the warrior spirit. Which, in hindsight, probably deserves a bump too. Otherwise, yeah, save for teleporterless rollouts, the consumption effect is always a handicap. But that's okay. Not every weapon needs to be good in every situation. They just have to be good in a few. Which brings me to the Delocus Bar, which is getting promoted to B tier. Now, in the context of a two cities tier list, I believe the original ranking was justified. Medic is a staple of 90% of teams, and the healing effects don't stack. But move away from Manhattan and Rottenburg, where keeping the dock benched is rather customary, and the chocolate is actually really good. Increasing your health by 17% during periods of downtime is the strongest self-imposed buff that the Heavy can provide himself with and he can do it multiple times a wave. As a support tool, the small medkit drop nerfs it heavily, and with a medic on your team, it's basically a paperweight. But B tier's the home of weapons that have somewhat common niches, and somewhat common niches it has. Not the banana though. I think I can confidently call this one the worst of the bunch. The banana does everything the sandwich does, but worse. The healing for yourself and for your teammates are both a fraction of what they usually are. This is for the trade-off of a much faster recharge, which is very good and casual. In fact, it's my main secondary there for this reason. But as I mentioned earlier, both needing and being able to eat your sandwich in the first place is already rare enough. But getting that uptick in HP, then requiring another one within exactly 12 to 29 seconds after expending the last one, that's a rarity within a rarity. Especially when health on kill is able to snowball you back up to full pretty easily. It does match the fit though, so you won't see me giving it up. We're still not done with heavy though, because... Uh, I neglected to mention a very important feature regarding a certain melee weapon at the time that wasn't all that well known. When the Heavy uses the Fists of Steel, the healing you receive is decreased by 40%, which provides the same expedited uber generation as the Soldier's Pickaxes. However, unlike the Pickaxes, as long as the Medic keeps his Medibeam attached to you, you're able to swap to your primary weapon and play the game as usual without breaking the Medic's doubled rate. That is undoubtedly a bug, but it's one that makes them the new king of the castle, especially when you consider that they still have the perk of being a great escape tool. The Guru shares that merit as well, and is still my personal favorite melee, but slightly faster rollouts and repositionings don't hold a candle to a charged Kritzkrieg every 30 seconds, without upgrades. Sorry Gru, you're getting knocked down a peg. Similarly to the criteria surrounding Heavy's food items, I believe the criteria surrounding the Engineer's wrenches has likewise become more refined. All a wrench really needs to do is be good at resupplying health and ammo, killing spies effectively whenever they show up, and maximizing tank DPS on ways where you're not using the Widowmaker. Anything on top of that is gravy, but the goal is to get these three categories as strong as possible. In this respect, I think I heavily underrated the Eureka effect. Yes, losing 20% of each metal box and dispenser tick is annoying, but it also comes with the benefit of having an on-demand teleport to spawn, which basically acts as having an upgrade station on standby. Sure, you have a two-way teleporter, but the wrench warp is faster, safer, and doesn't cost any credits. This also pretty much invalidates the construction speed penalty, because you can always warp back with an upgrade canteen whenever you please. I think this one was the biggest miss of the original series. I'm confident 
confident in bumping it from a D tier to a strong B. The Southern Hospitality, on the other hand, has degraded a lot in my opinion. You trade away your random crits in exchange for 6 seconds of bleed damage, which is a downgrade for dealing with spies and does fuck all in terms of tank busting. It also makes you 20% more vulnerable to fire damage, which doesn't come into play too often, but it's another bit of red text that no other wrench has to deal with. The only saving grace is that all of these downsides are situational. Half the time it's basically a stock wrench reskin, so I'll be generous in dropping it to the C tier only. Also, I predict I'm gonna get a couple of questions regarding the Jag, seeing as it appears to have similar gripes. The difference with that wrench is it provides an upside that only it can serve. You have better options for tank busting, your team can help you kill the spies, and you have the Rescue Ranger, Building Health, Wrangler Shield, and Upgrade Canteens to keep your sentry healthy. But you know what you don't have? A way to decrease the time it takes to replenish your sentry's ammo. The Jag is the only tool that has the ability to receive that very impactful swing speed buff which not only gives it a unique perk that nothing in the game can replicate, but also works to offset all of its other downsides. Looking at waves with both tanks and spies, I'd settle for the stock wrench, but pretty much everywhere else, I think the Jag comes out on top. Moving on to Medic, I think it's time we finalize the rankings for the syringe guns once and for all. I've gone back and forth on them for a while now. First off, I think I underrated the Blitzsauger. The added health on hit makes this thing a pretty reliable escape tool nearly 100% of the time. The main gripe I've always had with this weapon is the decreased amount of passive healing, which is definitely a negative. However, with how essential Engineer is as a class, it's rare to not have a dispenser within neck breathing distance that nullifies much of the nerfed regen. And of course, who can forget about Mad Milk syringes? Lord knows I can't. I'm thinking a light A tier for this one. For the overdose, this one has grown on me even more. The increased movement speed in relation to your uber charge percentage brings a lot of benefits. It can be good as an escape tool, good for regrouping with your teammates, good for restocking up on canteens, and also Mad Milk syringes. Not as consistent of an escape tool as the Blitzauger, as the maximum benefit isn't always a constant, but for how versatile this primary is, nowadays I find it the most optimal choice. S tier. Yeah, I think I overrated the crossbow a bit. Don't get me wrong, it's great for burst healing, long range plays, and is a pretty reliable sniper killer on top of that, but in man versus machine, your team plays relatively stationary. The many gun upgrades quickly outpace the burst healing, and if your team is competent, the sniper shouldn't be up for long. The benefits of the crossbow taper off rather quickly, whereas the overdose does not. So, I think a minor demotion is in order. And as for the stock syringe gun, I can't really think of a reason why you'd ever use this in favor of the overdose. I guess it does the most amount of DPS without having any passive negatives. Like the Southern Hospitality, I'm gonna be generous and give this one a light C tier. For Sniper, there's only really one change I'd like to make, and that's moving the stock Kukri up to S tier alongside the Bushwaka. Trying to quantify the collective utility across all ways for these weapons is harder than it seems, so I'm giving up and just ruling this one a draw. On waves with the Pokeboys, the stock melee is better. On waves with tanks you've been assigned to, the Bushwaka is better. On waves with neither, the occasional crit swings of the Kukri are about on par with the guaranteed ones that come via banners and target markings for the Bushwaka. You'll be swapping between them pretty regularly for most missions, so I'd say they both warrant a top tier ranking. And now we finish off on Spy, the class I still to this day have the least amount of experience with, and it showed in that original ranking. First, let's get the easy one out of the way. The L'Etranger and the Diamondback deserve to be swapped. Now, don't get me wrong, having a full storage locker's worth of crits is both fun and effective, but your armor pen backstabs are the centerpiece of your viability. Having a primary that makes it safer to be in those risky positions is far more valuable than the occasional 102 damage shots. That's the Latrange Incarnate. The worry about not having your get out of jail free card on lock is mitigated heavily. You can pretty much load that bitch up for free whenever needed. So yeah, probably my second biggest miscalculation next to the Eureka effect. My apologies to all of the MBM spy mains who yelled at me in the comments. 
all four of you. I also want to shout out the stock in Vizwatch and Cloak and Dagger for being not as bad as originally stated. I accidentally forgot to put on my Dead Ringer at one point and realized, you know, having an on demand 20% damage resistance will always be better than an uncharged pocket watch. And while you do want to minimize those situations as much as possible, sometimes you'll need to go for that crucial kill whether your Dead Ringer's up or not. In those specific situations, the instantaneous cloak is definitely a plus side, enough to bump it up to a C tier ranking. And to round off Spy's arsenal, let's go over the knives once again. My opinions have flip-flopped all over the place with these ones. The kunai is the best choice for much of the early and middle waves, where there's a constant stream of small robot backs ready to be poached. This is the vast majority of the waves in the game, but they're also simultaneously the ones where Spy is the worst performing class by a significant margin. The big earner is a bit different. It's more viable on waves where both giant and small robot threats are relatively equalized. You're able to focus down the giants as usual, but with the added benefit of greater movement speed and added cloak regen you'll get from those periodic small bot one taps. These waves are less common than the add intrusive ones, but this is where the spy starts to slip into viable territory. And as for the stock knife, this one's the best on waves that consist of basically nothing but big boys, especially the giant quick fix medics. These are the rarest waves in the game, but they're also the ones where the spy is extremely effective. In fact, he's pretty much a meta staple. So, what's the verdict here? Is the kunai the best because it's the top dog on the highest percentage of waves? Is the stock knife the best because it's the go-to on waves where spies that is most viable? Hell, maybe it's the case that the variables coalesce enough to where all three of them deserve to be S tier. Uh, pff, I don't fucking know. To me, Spy is nothing more than a booby trap to get easy clips of noobs eating shit. In fact, fuck it. We're putting the Your Eternal Reward in the S tier. Go spread some propaganda to make my job easier. Not like it matters anyways. And that's it. This is every weapon I've changed my opinion on over the past two years. Maybe I'll expand more on some of my older content if the demand is there. If that's something you guys want to see, be sure to give this video a like, comment some dumb shit down below, Low, and garnish that bitch with an S tier of your own. We all know I need it. As always, thank you all for watching the video. Twitter and Discord are in the description. And that's all I got. See ya.